Forget everything you know about supply chain security. Welcome to another episode of Global Insights and Professional Security. I'm your podcast host, Michael Gibbs, and today we're going to be hosting Chris Nissen, who has a very expansive and uh, maybe even revolutionary view of supply chain security. Uh, Global Insights and Professional Security is where we tackle big issues, how security relates to themes such as law, to media, entertainment, and today, supply chain. Welcome, Chris, and, and tell us about your background. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, Mike. Um, yeah, so I'm an um, um, uh, electrical engineer by training. Um, I've spent um, over 30 years at the MITRE Corporation, um, and most of that has been in uh, counterintelligence, um, in, um, you know, uh, all the trade craft uh, that we use for our national security, both offensive and defensive. And I also had the great um, privilege to be able to spend about four years as a, as a national level intelligence analyst at the NCTC. So that gave me an opportunity to see uh, strategic intelligence um, and work on specific portfolios. So it's kind of a unique background, both technical and um, formal intelligence. Excellent. Thanks for that. So let's jump right into what I um, have been uh, pushing here, which is you have a broader view of supply chain and supply chain security than one might see in practice or in an ISO, an ISO standard. Can you tell us um, the components you consider to be part, part of the supply chain and also describe your approach in general and why you feel it might be a better way to go? I mean, it's a complementary way to go. So the, the, the market that exists out there now, if you just Google supply chain security, certainly two years ago, um, was almost exclusively sort of um, almost logistical. That is, you know, what do I do if I don't have a product coming in or, um, you know, in my production environment? Uh, and that's fine. And it's well developed. Um, and a lot's happened. It's actually pushed us into what um, we call just-in-time manufacturing today, which is um, been a problem with COVID. I'm looking at it more from a um, security risk, an unknown operational risk that your enterprise has if you're in the private sector or the nation has if you're looking about looking at national security. And, and that means adversaries who are coming in um, through supply chain techniques that want to do harm to you or your enterprise. So from that standpoint, I apply what we call in counterintelligence a blended operation, and that is maybe four major attack vectors at the highest level. Um, one being cyber IT, um, which obviously there's an awful lot of work in cyber IT, and uh, you know almost everybody's working there. But then there's cyber OT or operational technology. Those are systems with real-time deadlines, um, airplanes, energy systems, manufacturing systems. Those are really important because you can't just apply standard principles like encryption and um, authentication like you can on an IP or an IT system. Why? Because all the adversary has to do is mess with that encryption, mess with that authentication. It fails and the real-time deadline fails, um, which is catastrophic, for instance, if, you're, if it's the pilot pushing on the stick, he needs those engines and control surfaces to do what they need to do. The other that's often overlooked um, and is getting a little bit more attention uh, since uh, our report came out is I call the human element. Um, so that is insider, outsider, witting, unwitting. There's people <laughs> that are making all these systems work. Um, there are organizations now starting to layer on top of that something called cognitive security. I won't get into that here. And then what you would call formal supply chain. That is software, hardware raw materials. If you're in medicine, it's your, you know, whatever you need to make your product and then services. So most people think of supply chain here. Um, I draw a circle around this and say, it's important to look at all of these because the adversaries move in and out of these different attack vectors as a function of opportunity, strategic intent, timing, etc. So it's taking a counterintelligence view of how are they um, realizing their um, effect? And that's important to every, literally every company in the world, um, and some more than others, whether or not you're doing work for the government or national security. It's um, global, global economic security at this point, and beyond economics. 
that's fascinating, taking a counterintelligence view of the supply chain. Obviously, uh, intelligence departments, corporate security departments do counterintelligence, but not necessarily in the context of the supply chain. Now, tell us, you talk, you know, we, we talk about asymmetric risks where an adversary just has to do a little bit to cause a, an enormous consequence. You know, guerrilla warfare might be a classic example. Can you tell us about asymmetric risks and and where we are as a nation, both uh, United States uh, defense posture and our organizations, our corporations? Sure. Um, as a matter of fact, um, about four and a half, five years ago, it kind of dawned on me. Um, I was being asked to think about what do we need to do prepare to prepare, you know, on the global stage. Um, and it kind of dawned on me that it's a home game and not an away game. Um, so as I dug into that, and this happened in about the course of a day, and I invited a couple friends in and we kind of whiteboarded it, you know, it, it, it really, I argue that we're in an asymmetric era. These aren't just asymmetric techniques. And what I mean by that is we have had sort of at the national level, a nuclear era, which is underscored by strategic nuclear deterrence, followed by a conventional era, underscored by strategic conventional deterrence. And now we're in the asymmetric era, and I argue that because um, China and Russia, for instance, um, in the late 80s, early 90s, um, were talking about not wanting to engage the United States um, kinetically. And hence, they wanted to engage us, and it was their word, asymmetrically. And what they mean by that is um, there's, you know, there's only so many ways to fight. You know, the four that I like to think of is um, win by fighting, win by not fighting, win by not losing, win by disrupting. Well, win by fighting is kinetic. These other three um, really start to help one understand what's going on in the, in the world. So guerrilla warfare is win by not losing. It's death by a thousand cuts. Um, win by not fighting is what's happening in the South China Sea. Um, now, you know, they've, they've lowered the international acceptance for navigable waters, and we think it's a big deal if we, you know, sail a destroyer class through it. Um, and it's very provoking, right? Uh, that's not right. They won without fighting. What we're talking about here, so asymmetric is moving in and out of those, those three. Um, a lot of what's challenging our world today um, and where supply chain comes in is win by disrupting. And that disruption at the highest level has three main uh, purposes. One is just to steal, steal intellectual property. Uh, could be far, far worse than that, but, but that may one reason for getting in through this supply chain that I laid out. Another is uh, uh, to build up a collection network. These are intelligence services that do this, um, that may then feed other arms. And, and even if it's not a nation state, if it's a well-organized group, um, intelligence and, and being able to um, collect plans and, and record conversations, and that is important. And the third is the most um, insidious, I think, in, in many ways, is that uh, it can make the system not do what it's supposed to do when it's supposed to do it. And by that, it can be, um, you know, it could be for a number of reasons. All of this comes under what you would call economic, uh, economic aggression. And if you're a private sector company over here, like Sony, and you happen to, you know, tick off somebody because of a movie you made, you can be shown to suffer greatly. <laughs> um, you could be nudged out of a market. Uh, so it's national security thought of in terms of that asymmetric uh, 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 perspective. The problem is, of course, the North Star has to be um, strategic comprehensive deterrence. Right now we have... Um, I won't say next to no deterrence. I think we had none for a long time. And um, the challenge that we have is that they've had, you know, 20 or 30 years on us. Um, there really wasn't widespread recognition of this um, until maybe 2013. Um, and right around the time of the OPM breach, where it's, uh, wow, man, maybe they're not just interested in taking our data for uh, financial purposes. Maybe they're interested in something far more sinister. Yeah, that's, um, that's fascinating and, and, and terrifying at the same time. You talked a little about, you talked about Sony, and obviously we know that uh, China uh, imposes a, um, is a state actor that sort of manifests itself through purported Chinese companies. They really uh, have complete control over them. And 
they send their folks in and they're they're exfiltrating information, exfiltrating data out of U.S. and and global companies, really. So, how does your structure address? Okay, how how do we, as a corporation, say a say we're we're creating a you know say we're agriculture and creating new seeds that are resistant to to famine or drought or, or, or so how does this apply how does your approach apply to the private sector well uh it applies and the main application is that until, without the recognition of this asymmetric threat that's being executed um your company is carrying what i call unknown operational risk um so if you're a high-tech company um, many, you know, for in engineering, there's been something called mission assurance for a long time or product assurance. And engineers know very well how to, say, move from a $50 part to a $20 part and still ensure integrity, change the design for redundancy, lower the increase the profit, but maintain mean time between failure. The problem is that there's this other risk that I call unknown. Um, because, you know, when we put out this report of, of going on three years ago now, um, it really woke a lot of people up. I mean, I, my, my son's a software developer and I handed him a copy and he took it to work. He's with a, a midsize, small, small startup, um, you know, 100 people maybe. And uh, he said everybody was floored. They're like, we, we don't write software thinking that anyone's trying to do this and there's the problem <laughs> so so every company uh if you're a target and most are <laughs> um you know they are uh carrying this unknown risk and where we're at in the corporate c-suite recognition of that risk um is probably about where we were at in cyber risks 15 or 20 years ago and i argue Within the next few years, and in, in many ways, it's already happening. It's no longer going to be acceptable to not be doing due diligence on your supply chain security the way that I'm defining it. And the reason is uh, the risk audit subcommittee, they're going to care <laughs> as they become aware of it. Your creditors, your investors, your shareholders, and the entity, your insurers, and the entities um, above and below you that you know, when, as they start to realize, and we're seeing it in some industries, that if you're writing a piece of software and my design team says my company needs it and you have no idea what's in that code because you don't have even a basic software bill of material, you're not doing basic, you know, uh, good practices, then it's not worth what you think it's worth. And I'm not going to bring that into my enterprise and then have to, without having to um, mitigate those risks for me. So, this is just starting to occur where um, the report really got uh, the Congress uh, interested. I know of two CEOs that unbeknownst to me at the time read the report and they reorganized their companies, good sized companies, big companies um, along supply chain security. Um, and they even put the CISO <laughs> because in my model, cyber IT and their information systems are only part of the equation. Wow. So the, the CISO reports to supply chain or yeah, vice president in charge of supply chain, right? Wow. That's uh, transformative and, and they're large companies. That's, that's really significant. Let's talk a little about the very diverse and dynamic and evolving threat profile that faces companies and governments these days. We have everything from, you know, the traditional insider threats to the, the IT threats like ransomware and phishing and now you have disinformation campaigns by governments, by individuals, by groups um, that make us question our own institutions. We have work at home threats during COVID and the pandemic. So how do these issues all play into the supply chain threat? Well, the, you know, the adversary finds it a very um, low hanging fruit environment right now um, because what they've done is they've, you know, using these techniques going back uh, a long time, but really applying them toward our country and the West in general, they clearly recognize, um, you know, our adversaries are generally um, uh, socialist countries that don't have the same kind of freedoms we do for their individuals. So they recognize the division of power and the privacy protections, and they know very well how to snuggle right up in between those seams 
and exploit that. It's one of the it's one of the reasons they've been so successful. Um, and we're just now starting to grapple with that, in my view. You know, you land on a, on a server in the U.S. and it's a totally different game. You have to have the right authorities to be looking at those because of private of privacy protections. So they're using this environment. You know, some of the things you just mentioned, um, you know, when I said economic aggression, you know, some people call that outright economic warfare. And it really depends who the aggressor is, right? Because, you know, China has a different strategic interest at the end of the day than maybe Iran does or, or, or Russia. Um, but the tools that, that they use are all going to be of the same trade craft, more, more than likely. Different, different applications. But, but the point is that um, some of that up there is disinformation, for instance, can be trying to you know, shift the morale even, or, or instill lack of trust in a government. That's very different than a technical operation um, that's trying to steal your IP or trying to, um, um, you know, put controls in place that can be used as, a, as an anti-lever. So an example there I use, you know, the title of the first report was um, um, the changing character of war. And, and, I, and I use that because at the time, Secretary Mattis was struggling with, you know, I never thought war would change, and I'm starting to question that. And I think this work puts its finger right on that pulse, because at the time, I think um, we were bombing Syria or something, and Russia was there. Um, and, uh, you know, I just hypothesized, what if the response back isn't kinetic? What if the response back is natural gas compressor stations blowing up all across the United States? Because at the time, there were natural gas lines blowing up in Andover, Massachusetts, and nobody knew why. And, and having worked in critical infrastructure, I knew right away it's probably overpressure. The question is, is it malicious or is it accidental? Um, so that can be the response. And that changes the character of war because no one around the president's can, uh, cabinet can tell him what's going on. And if they can, it's probably misattributed. So they can't tell who do we respond against, right? So in that scenario, you could have Russia's response if they decided to be in our infrastructure, making it look like it came from another country. That's a mess and we have to get our hands around it. Um, and, that's, and that's why this work has lit up um, both the market and the private sector for saying, hey, we can be targets um, in, in this big economic warfare um, and national security is being really redefined. I mean, um, the ability to move money, energy, and information um, has little to do with the government. As a matter of fact, the government really doesn't build anything. Everything is done in the private sector. So when you say private sector, I interpret that as, oh, those companies which aren't under contract to the government, which you fall under federal acquisition regulation or defense federal ac acquisition regulation, where they can say, you must, even then they don't, only recently have they started really doing something there. But when we use the term private sector, there's a much bigger world out there um, for companies that are just minding their own business. They're huge targets though, potentially, dual use technology companies. Um, I know one in, um, they were making high, high energy lasers and I talked to the CEO, small company, and um, he, uh, his best friend and, and partner um, walked out the door one day um, with all of his IP and went back to China, part of a thousand talents program. So he said, I, I probably won't be in business in six months. And that means the United States loses access to that ability to manufacture high energy lasers, which are used in both military and industrial applications. So. It's that unknown risk. So that point you brought up about about asymmetric threats and about you know it's not traditional warfare and and we don't know who the adversary is and they can make them seem like a different adversary. That sort of puts a kibosh on on uh, deterrence, much less mutually assured destruction, uh, which is a um, sort of artifact of um, the Cold War era. Uh, so, you know, that's fascinating. So just to, let's go to, to nuts and bolts. Like if you're a CEO or, or security executive in this risk environment, what advice would you give to them? Yeah, um, that's a great question. I'm going to 
make sure I get something on you because I don't want to get the title Dr. Doom, right? Because <laughs> all of this is solvable. It just takes time, right? So there are ways of knowing who did what, but it depends um, what forensics you have and, and, and how much you've been looking, right? So in the heat of battle, when things are just blowing up in the example I gave, well, you're not going to know because there was no radar track. <laughs> When you get into the forensics, we do have ways, and the private sector is, is very good at this in some areas, of understanding, ah, that's typical of the Russians, or, oh, that's typical of these people. So just so, you know, just want to make that clear. But it's typical of them. doesn't mean it is. I mean, the Russians True. are smart enough to, to copy what the North Koreans do yeah. or what Iranians do and blame it on them. So, yeah. Yeah, and, and what's interesting here, though, and I get to that last question, is um, what they're doing there is – introducing ambiguity and that's how we have to fight back we're so open they're very certain if we drive ambiguity into their calculus then that slows them down buys them time um, and can give them doubt and even regret if they make the wrong move so um you know like i said if i were in the c-suite and i do um, consult to a couple companies to help them with their deliver uncompromised strategies um, the very first thing you have to do is um, do a risk assessment on what kind of and how big of a target you are. And that's in the greater ecosystem. I can give you some examples. Um, risk we define in, in the way many people have, but with a little more detail as uh, it's a function of threat, vulnerability, and consequence. Those are three different types of teams, right? And I've never seen anyone use all three of them. So Threat, we really almost don't have to talk about because that is, does someone have the intent and the capability? Yeah, they do. <laughs> if we're talking nation states, <laughs> um, they may not have intent if, you know, you're a landscaper somewhere or you make lawnmowers. Maybe they don't. Maybe they do. I don't know. You got, you got to look at your world. Um, and then the second one is vulnerability. And that requires engineers because engineers haven't been trained to look at their systems as vulnerable to these kind of attacks. I'll give you an example. You know, we'll often, you know, we brag about, oh, we've, you know, uh, encrypted this or encrypted that. Um, but, you know, if it's an airborne asset, even in a commercial plane, and, you know, they've attacked the power supply and it starts smoking, what do you think you're going to do? <laughs> you're going to stop the mission, shut it off, and halt. They've succeeded. You know, uh, so you got to think uh, differently and the engineers um, need to start uh, getting back to that. We used to do a lot of that um, with fault tolerant computing and other techniques. And then the last one is consequence. And that's really the, the operator. It's the, it's the owner of the mission. So is, is it uh, fixable or fatal? That is, is the, is the consequence that the mission failed? The mission may be, you know, your, your production line running. Um, it may be the customer that you're providing being able to do their calls like we're doing <laughs> so this call failed because somebody intercepted it and now we were trying to have a private conversation and that's gone is that fixable or fatal mean fatal means um does it completely do they win and you know it just comes to a grinding halt are there ways to continue on and and in that case communicate even in a degraded state and that resilience, that's really how I define resilience, is important. So you look at those three, and I recommend to, to big companies, and again, cyber IT, OT, human, and formal supply chain, which do you know the least about in your company? Which are you the most worried about? And how are you going to then uh, place yourself in the overall ecosystem? And, and, and by ecosystem, I mean, you know, we know and it's pretty obvious to people if you think about it. Um, you have to think about it from a counterintelligence perspective, though, which is my other piece of advice. The CEOs need to get these people in there and at least oversee it, right? <laughs> help, help, help them build a team. But um, we know that, you know, the other realization of this asymmetry is the adversaries love to have a little bit of effort for a huge payoff. So Kaspersky was a clear one, right? You know, if I were you, if I were trying to attack you, I would attack your hard disk. So I've got a product. Give us root access and we'll protect your information. In reality, they sucked it all off of there and they have the equivalent of Google search over 500 million computers. Um, 
So that was huge benefit payback. Um, SolarWinds, kind of the same thing. It's like, wow, if I go into the network management suite, then I get in all of these companies and I've got hooks in them all. It was much easier than coming right into the company, right? So it's that risk reward is so high. So if you and your industry are in one of them, um, if you're manufacturing things with uh, technologies that you're one of the, you're the first in the world, or one of the first, or you're you're some of the last that's able to do it in the United States, cost effectively. You're huge on that target, and and the numerical number that you would put at risk um, in that equation um, really has to figure into something I'm working on is a risk monetization model. Because at the end of the day, um, the C-suite uh, has to have an appetite. They have to recognize their appetite for risk. You know, if, if you've got a, if you've got a, uh, at the two extremes, you know, a wild appetite for it, then you don't worry about it and you're rolling the dice all the time. Um, the audit committee might not care for that. Your investors might not care for that, but you have to agree at where is it. On the other hand, you lock everything down so tight, your, your, your company is shriveling. So there's some mix in there, but at the end of the day, you have to feel that we're mitigating the risks to the first order, at least for the amount of money that we're putting in that's commiserate with um, the, the risk that it will cost us, whether it's in market share, brand, um, whatever, um, we can then justify those dollars that we spend. And with that awakening, I think you're gonna see um, this market just continue to accelerate. Well, that's, that's really good advice. I like to think of it as, so you defined uh, risk as um, function of threat, vulnerability, and consequence. And it's sort of an equation, you know, that you see it like threat times, uh, uh, is, uh, five times vulnerability times consequence. If you can get one of them down to zero, just basic math or close to zero, then the whole thing is there. Now you can't control the threat, right? But you can control the vulnerability and the consequence. Yep. Um, of course it's all, it's, it's all risk appetite, you know, um, do you want to shut everything down? You can clamp down things. I mean, nothing's perfectly impregnable, but you can bring vulnerability down pretty pretty low, but then you're, you're hamstringing everyone. And consequence, you can reduce as well. But when you do that, you're also, again, hurting your own, um, you know, production abilities and-, and Well, it depends. it depends if it's at the mission level or not. So I have some other tenants. Um, there's a paper um, that I co-wrote that should be coming out here any day. Um, one of them is, you know, assume permeability. I think that's one of the mistakes that's being made in the cyber world today. Um, you know, I, I argue in that, that paper's on software supply chain, but, you know, it's basically saying um, that, you know, we're, we're trying to prevent anything from happening. And that's a fallacy, you know, that some of the best, and I've had some private conversations with some world-class uh, design engineers from Silicon Valley and the Pacific Northwest that work for design the entire infrastructure for big companies. And uh, they said, no, we just assume we're permeable. And hence we take, we make it very hard to move laterally. So you, you lose layered security. That's a, that's a different mindset. And even with um, consequence, you know, I, 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 I believe that if we start designing our systems so that they can fight through, and that can be the enterprise or your product, then a, that's a little bit of a deterrence because you're not going to stop me. And if you're not going to stop me, then I've got resilience. And that resilience will be valuable for things that aren't necessarily a hostile attack, right? So if you can, if yep. you can combine mission assurance with this, now it's like, okay, I'm more interested in looking at how to design that. And we've kind of gotten away from that in, in the years. We, matter of fact, we're heading the other way. We, for efficiency, we consolidate. And when we consolidate, the frig, frig, uh, um, fragility goes through the roof. Um, so, so diversification, even in an enterprise, again, frustrates the adversary, gives you uh, diversity and makes it um, more resilient than, than, than fragile. Uh, that's a great point. And we only have about a minute left, but... I want to give you a chance to talk. You have a podcast and other content that 
has emerged from the report that you mentioned earlier called uh, that you wrote from MITRE that's called Deliver Uncompromised. Tell us about that. Um, tell us about your podcast and where to find those reports and the upcoming one that you mentioned. Sure. Um, yeah. So I've, I've got a, yeah, I've just, I've probably given over a hundred talks and different panel sessions and consulting um, to, to companies. There's just been so much interest in this. And that report came out in April of 2018. Um, you can go to my YouTube channel, which I've just started last weekend. Uh, and it's, it's meant to have guests on as well as um, be able to comment and, and continue to advance the dialogue. Because there's lots happened since we came out with that report. And my thinking is continually um, a lot um, developing. The channel on YouTube is called Deliver Uncompromised. Just those two words. Um, in it, if you go to the about, there's a link just as 2018 report um, that one ha happens to be hosted by the DNI. Um, you can also Google um, MITRE deliver uncompromised. Um, be careful. There's my report from 2018 and then there's another document that has it up at the top. Um, so you're better off getting it from YouTube probably. Um, I'm going to be standing a website up soon um, because uh, I think that um, there's some interesting white papers and that could, that could, um, be useful. The, the paper that will be coming out of MITRE soon um, is just called Beyond Solar Winds: Principles for Securing Software Supply Chains. So that's a little bit of what we're talking here, um, some of those principles. Um, so it's, a, it's a higher level, should be a quick read. So yeah, anybody, and then you can get me on LinkedIn. So if anybody, um, my email's there, you can message me on LinkedIn. My email's in the Deliver Uncompromised on, um, on YouTube. And please subscribe. My whole intention um, is to, I've got two target audiences with almost all the work I'm doing right now. Um, and I'm toying, well, and I'm more than toying. I'm you know, starting to codify some of this in a book. I think that that would be useful for, for but the audience is the C-suite and to, to help them understand the problem and motivate them to drive it down from the top and the implementers. Because I hear so many stories in industry where the guys and gals that are running the infrastructure, they know, they see vulnerabilities that they have, but upstairs they don't recognize it and hence they don't get the budget and resources that they need. As, as opposed to these other two companies where the CEO said, this can make, if we move first, this is value added that will, we'll get more customers because it's kind of like you know people buy a Volvo because they perceive it as being safer than buying maybe a Yugo. Um, so those CEOs are saying, I want to position my brand now and, and you can't take it on all at once, but you look at it. And one of them said to me, I want to go after insider because we just don't know our people. And, and that's a whole article that I'm going to do a, a good video on. I've got a great guest to have on there. Um, you got to be careful because you don't want to create an environment of everyone looking over their shoulders and not trusting um, it's really insider risk, and we can talk more about that in the future. So, yeah, I would love people to uh, reach out with any questions, and, and I want to help. Well, on that note, Chris, thanks for appearing on the show. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to be here.